After a week of tense debate between the president, Congress, and our allies, and a last-ditch campaign to bring his case for action against Syria to the American people, the president has said that at least for now there will be no American missile strikes against Syria. Instead, tonight he sent the Secretary of State to Switzerland to sort out whether Russia can help secure Syrian chemical weapons. Meanwhile, for the Syrians, the war goes on. With 100,000 dead and so many of the casualties children, it's hard not to wonder if children are being targeted deliberately. The head of human rights at the UN believes they are. So, for the past week, ABC's Lama Hassan and a team of Nightline producers have been with a group of doctors, volunteers, who have traveled to the region to minister to the wounds of the innocent children caught in the crossfire. As you will see, much of what they saw is upsetting and graphic. Monday morning, an Amman Jordan and two-year-old Rajad is putting on a brave face. But underneath this blanket, a shrapnel wound in her stomach so infected it will not heal. That's heartbreaking. No. Far away in Washington, D.C., President Barack Obama is spending the day locked in a room with his advisors, preparing for an unprecedented series of interviews. And that's in our national security interest. Making the case for targeted strikes against the government, Rajat's parents and the doctors here blame for this. She was playing on the veranda of their home and there was rocket fire and a shrapnel struck her in the le her basically her left side and blew out all of her intestinal abdominal contents. Okay. Dr. Abdin Nebi practices in Texas, but over the next 72 hours, as world leaders waver on whether or not to intervene in the civil war that shattered half a ragged little body, Abdin Nebi will try to give this toddler back the gift of walking, playing, being a child. Okay, launch. Start going. Six days ago. Jump in, guys. Even in the video. Okay, we need to move. We traveled here to Jordan with Abdel Nabi and a group of 29 other medical professionals from all over the world. We have 750 pounds worth of medication right now. Led by Dr. Humam Akbik. Can we go make the list of the patients? Who practices at Mercy Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. They are all volunteers and they will spend a precious week amid the youngest casualties of a brutal civil war in Syria that is bleeding out across its borders. Do you know typically what cases are on this floor? Well, there's about 32 beds in, on this floor. Um, they get various cases. Most of it is gunshot wounds. Uh, shrapnels, upper and lower extremities, and mostly abdominal injuries. As the doctors see patients, a fierce debate is taking shape on the other side of the world over whether America should intervene in the war, which has unleashed this river of two million refugees. I don't really like to talk politics with my patients because I'm here just to help them. But what you overhear that um, Everybody is in favor. Everybody's sick of the war. Everybody wants to go home. And everybody's now looking that the strike is their way home. With that American strike seeming all but imminent, Dr. Akbik, whose well-to-do family still lives in the Syrian capital, understands why the refugees are counting on it. This is the line for their life. This is it. Everything for them right now, all, all, all hands on deck. This is it. This is it. This is their hope. I, I cannot. I cannot imagine what what their reaction is going to be if they heard that this pulled, the U.S. pulled out, or the strike is not going to happen. So this has really put their hopes up. Their only hope. This is. They have no more hope. Many of the refugees and the wounded are children. Their families left to nurse them without assistance through injuries unimaginable to most parents. Children like Rajat, a toddler who is in constant agony and has been unable to sit, no less stand, since she was wounded. She was born into this war in a town called Dara, little more than an hour drive from here in peacetime. But for Rajat's entire life, the town has been the scene of fierce warfare between the rebels and the Syrian government. Now her mother, pregnant, sleeps beside her on the floor here in the clinic. 
She left her home, her husband, her whole extended family in desperate search for help the day Ragad was hit. Her mother rushed her to the local hospital where they could not do anything. And so the mother and daughter kept moving and ended up here in Jordan. This is a little baby. She should be out playing and running. She should not have her sides blown out and her intestines hanging out of her. While Ragad waits for further treatment, her new roommate arrives outside, another girl with a similar injury. She is 14-year-old Khaitan, fleeing with her family when their home came under fire. A sniper's bullet tore through the door of their moving car and passed straight through her body. Two emergency surgeries kept her alive, but she's lost 30 pounds, wasting away. The journey here has left her family almost penniless. All the money he has, he left here. All of their clothes tossed into two trash bags. Khaitan meets Dr. Abdel Nabi. Her insides have been shredded and she needs her intestines sewn back up, a procedure she can't get in the refugee camp where she lives. It's in this area here, left buttock, and then it traversed here with the exit wound. Here. Yeah. Ragad and Khaitan lying side by side in this hospital will not see or hear as the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, tells Charlie Rose that Obama is mistaken. We live here, we know what's happening, and they have to listen to people who live here. They cannot listen to their, only to their media or to their research centers. They don't live here, no one lives here but us. So this is the reality and warns Americans that he is at war with Islamic militants. If the American administration wanted to support Al-Qaeda, go ahead. That's what they ha we have to tell them. Go ahead and support Al-Qaeda. Over the next two days, important decisions will be made in Washington, Moscow, and Syria, while Dr. Abdel Nabi will try to rebuild Khaitan's decimated stomach. Trim the edges and then basically hook them back up. Restore GI continuity and find a way to relieve little Rajad's terrible agony. Caught in the crossfire continues after this. This special edition of Nightline continues. 14-year-old Khaitan's doctors are hard at work, trying to undo the damage wrought by a Syrian sniper's bullet. It passed through her as she sat in the back of her family car, fleeing an attack on their village in Syria. Uh, clamp, clamp. Outside the OR, her parents wait anxiously, calling relatives in Syria to ask them to pray for their daughter. They have given up everything they own to get Khaitan to this hospital in Amman, Jordan. Their entire focus is on their daughter. We are here on a medical mission with doctors who have come from around the world to do what they can for wounded refugees. Kashmir, where is Kashmir? While elsewhere, the debate goes on about U.S. airstrikes and chemical weapons. I have uh, a line here, or I, I have that I'm going to put them outside. Whoops. Are I'm you going to put them outside? outside. Okay, no space for them. Okay. They set up field clinics in villages and move into entire floors of Jordanian hospitals while the war rages just 60 miles away. Uh, pharmacy, where the pharmacy? Right there. It's all set up. We do not discriminate. We do not ask who you are. We do not ask what religion. Dr. Akbik, who is Syrian-American, says some people languish for weeks and months with unspeakable injuries. We go to areas that nobody been through before. We do cases that nobody has done before. We go see patients that nobody wants to care for. How you got injured, this is all irrelevant to us. But as Akbik makes rounds in yet another hospital ward, the TV is almost always tuned to a channel run by the Free Syrian Army. He's for the American strikes, but he's just worried about the civilians and civilian areas. Um, that's the only thing that worries him, but he's for it, he's pro it. He's saying that he's for it, he wants Obama to go in and strike, but he's just worried about the civilians. He just says he hopes that he hits government mi uh, military installations. So many of the patients are so young. This is sort of things that we really like to drive attention to. There's somebody there that sounds like he needs help. Um, he's, yeah, he's, this is a guy who had um, a 
um, open wound and they are trying to change his dressing right now and unfortunately we don't have painkillers. You don't have painkillers? We, it's very scary. They only, we only have but very this is, few. I mean, this is a, quite a modern hospital. Yes, yeah, still, they, they have very limited supplies because of this, the restriction on morphine. So they only use it in the operating rooms. He is a college student in his early 20s. He asked us not to show his face for fear of retaliation on his family who is still in Syria. <sighs> After we spoke to him, his father took us to one side um, and he said, my son thinks that his mother is still alive because we want to keep his spirits up. We want him to get better. But it turns out that his mother isn't. She's, she's dead. After we leave the room... He will do much better if they amputate his, uh, his leg right oh. now. So, right now? Right now. So they are trying to figure out how they're going to break the news to the father, oh how they're going to break the news to him. Are we able to do it? The doctors hesitate. Oh, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist. How am I going to break this thing to a 20-year-old guy? How am I going to tell him, your mother died, your sister's paralyzed, I'm going to cut your leg. How, how are we going to do all this? I mean, how, it's just, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's just like, I don't know where to start. Then too, what are you going to tell him now? Are you going to tell him his leg can be amputated? Are you going to tell him he's your sister? Wait, hold up. He'll wait. I think he's like, wait. We have a nation of crippled young men and women. The PTSD, the trauma, the psych trauma. I saw the look on your face. I saw the look on um, um, your colleagues' friends when that guy was telling the story. You can imagine, do, multiply this by hundreds and thousands of stories. Down the hall, 14-year-old Khaitan's parents are about to learn the results of their daughter's surgery. So I'm going to do just one last scrub, and then we get to talk to the parents. تعالوا 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 كل خير إن شاء الله تعال. So it looks good, so we're very hopeful and optimistic. The tears are bittersweet. Grateful his daughter will soon be healthy again, but heartsick about everything else he lost along the way. Straight on to the next case. But there is little time to rest for Dr. Abdennabi, now on her way to help two-year-old Dragad, whose open wound is still not healing. She and the other American doctors have improvised a vacuum from spare parts. They hope will seal and drain Ragad's wound. Hours later, there is good news for little Ragad. Cutie pie. Dr. Abdennabi's makeshift device actually works. And in the next bed, Khaitan is also waking up. We see a smile for the first time since we've met her. I'm so happy, she says, now that my surgery is done. The girls and their families will be allowed to stay at the hospital for a few more days, but it won't be long before their beds are needed for new patients. Really, this is called a lost country right now. You are beyond, the catastrophe is beyond, and that's where the urgency comes, that this thing has to end and has to end now. This morning, with the headline that President Obama spoke to the world announcing a strike against Syria was put on hold, the exhausted medical team wraps up and gets ready to leave. Dr. Akbik, while proud of his work, is still stunned. The emotions right now is overwhelming. Basically, what we understand from what Obama said, that as long as you're killing people with traditional arm, but you're not using chemical weapon, it is okay. We really, we really don't understand if there's going to be any end to this block. Everybody's talking about the light of the end of the tunnel. Unfortunately, it's a dark tunnel. I don't see any lights there. For two families displaced by war, their children are safe for now. But the fate of their country is still uncertain as ever, and neither knows where they'll go next or if they'll ever go home. I'm Lam Hassan for Nightline in Amman, Jordan. Our thanks to Lama for that report.